I'm so happy to be here. This is my first time in India. It's not my first time that I said yes to an adventure with Christina because of things like this. <laughs> so, yeah, as Christina said, I started working with her a while ago. I have a background in still photography, but that changed into video one time when Christina was on the phone with Sony and she was going to Madagascar and she needed to find a way to get me there too. And so on the phone I hear, oh, you need a video. Oh, well, my assistant can do that. And I'd never picked up a video camera. So <laughs> this is the first time I held a video camera. It's a huge Sony. It shoots on tape. It's nothing like the DSLRs now that sort of would make more sense to someone coming straight from still to video. But I got to be in a situation like this. So this was the moment that I realized how complimentary video could be to these photographers that I knew well and was working with. So today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the most recent story I've been working on, which has been about elk migration into Yellowstone National Park. So like Christina said, and I'm going to back up a lot of the things she told, she talked about because she taught me all of them. But the challenge here was not only documenting migration that hadn't been documented before, but was to tell the story of Yellowstone National Park, which is the most storied park in all of the U.S. So one way that we decided to do that was to do this multidisciplinary project. So we had a scientist, here we go, we had a scientist, a painter, a photographer, and then myself, a filmmaker. So just by having the four people, we have four different ways of interpreting this story. So Arthur Middleton is the scientist, and he's the one who was the brains behind this whole project. And he'd been working in Yellowstone for 10 years. And he collared the elk and then would track you know, their migration. Then Joe and James and I came in and actually walked the migration trail with Arthur. So with the science, we get something like this. These migrations sprawl over an area five times bigger than Yellowstone National Park. And what that means is that Yellowstone depends on that entire area and all the land and all the people in it. So I don't know if you could all hear that, but he's basically saying, you know, the, the herds don't stay within the boundaries of Yellowstone. And so this animal that Yellowstone and the surrounding area completely, completely depends on is only protected for half of its year, half of its range. So, and also, no one really knew that they came from every direction. So these, the pulsing in and out of these migrations during the spring and the fall is just, it's the heartbeat of this ecosystem. So this is an amazing visual to have for the science community. And then it was huge that Arthur spent two years with artists trying to find ways to communicate this to larger audiences. Each color is a herd? Each color, yeah, is a herd. Oops, I don't think I can go back. Um, so this is the painter, James. And because of his work, he's very connected in the more fine art scene in New York. So we got funding for a big exhibit that started in Cody, Wyoming, right outside of Yellowstone National Park, and then also in National Geographic in D.C. And these exhibits will travel. So it's his art. It's also this big interactive map, photographs, and some video, too. But it was his work that got us this sort of, this kind of way of gathering an audience together. So these are some of the Instagram photos of us on our adventure. Um, you can sort of see the, the elk migration trails here. So we knew where they went because of the collars, but it was a very different thing to actually walk in their footsteps. So that was Joe setting up his camera trap. And then he gets photos like this, which are just incredible because you can't really get that close to a migration if you're there. So he sets up these camera traps. And you can tell, you can sort of see the trail. So we find these, these points where the landscape makes the herd go together. These are points in the migration route. And then, you know, this is a five-day hike slash mule ride into this location and he has to set up the camera trap and then something will inevitably go wrong a bear will get it day two or like hour two 
or the batteries will die or, you know, something happens. So he went into this spot five times, just five, five day trips. So it's, it's time consuming. Dedicated people. Uh, this is me. And this is a city dog, Jack the dog, who came with us. So because of Joe, we also had this interest in National Geographic, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but we had the whole May issue of Nat Geo was Yellowstone, and some of Joe's images were in that, and then some of my video and Joe's video were online behind the scenes. And then this is just a short clip from a 28-minute film that we made of Joe getting this very intimate portraits of a river crossing. So he not only did camera traps, but also standard photography. And there's audio. If you can't hear it, I'll sum it up afterwards. Other than my camera traps, this spot is as close as I'll get to the migration. able to capture that vulnerable moment right when they cross the river, feel lucky, super lucky. One, like Christina said, it's, so, it's really nice to give your audience some, a break from all the really heavy conservation messaging. So just a little bit of humor is nice. I think also giving people something to relate to, like a human character, that's what I've found works well with a lot of the work I do. I also have, like I said, worked with photographers a lot, so they're often a good character to, to relate to. Cause this was, we were lucky here, we spent three months in the field for this, but sometimes if you're doing a film about salmon or something that's not quite as charismatic as elk, you can't get people to fall in love with them quite as quickly. If you only have two minutes or three minutes for a video, but if you get an amazing person, a fisherman or someone in the community who loves the salmon, then maybe you'll get your audience to love them a little bit faster. Um, so we finished this film and it's starting to do the film festival circuits, so again, just another way to start this conversation, convene audiences, and then this is just an example of some of the other ways we're doing that. You know, a website, Instagram, Facebook, National Geographic, like I mentioned, and then we're all now sort of spread out doing our own presentations and trying to talk about it a little bit more. And that's all I have. Um, we have found, you know, when, when you sit in the doctor's office and you're browsing through a magazine and you're learning about all the clothes that, you know, Christina Aguilera was not wearing or whatever, and then you find a beautiful picture of an elk or a butterfly or a fish, you know, it has to be so beautiful that you actually want to read what it is. And the caption, I mean, the other thing I've learned as a conservation photographer is if you're a good writer, your pictures then are going to travel so much farther. Because we have to remember that the internet is searchable by text and not by photographs. And being a good writer really matters. But once you get somebody hooked on the caption, then maybe they will want to learn more and read the story and, and learn about conservation. So I think we lead with work that is really of high quality. That's, to me, that's the, the first step. I think. I think also putting yourself in it. So if it's something that's been told over and over again, if you can give it either personal slant through a character or if you write, Christina's captions are always very 
personal. It's, it's a sort of behind the scenes look. I think that gets people an insider scoop. It's helpful just to get that immediate. Absolutely. You know, we're so shy about you know saying this is how it felt like, this is what it smelled like, this is what I was afraid of. In, in, in our captions, and we don't want to put ourselves in the picture because we've been told not to for a long time. I think the photographer as a character in his or her own story is so important uh, because it helps us connect as humans with the issues that we care about. I've found that as beautiful as polar bears are, most people really don't care what's going to happen to polar bears. You know, they, don't, they will never go to the Arctic, they have no connection to ice or snow, so making that human connection. That's why Paul is so successful. You know, he's able to say, I, I love this. I grew up here. This is part of my identity. I care. And so maybe that answers part of the question. There's so many angles to a story. And you know, I, I find that there's no wrong way of telling a story. If it's authentic and credible, I do worry that a lot of photographers make up stuff. Or they give it to such a personal slant, I mean, that, that it's not actually factual. Um, so it's a very delicate balance, I think. Uh, but that's a really good question. I think it's also a cool time right now that we have so many different platforms to tell the story on. So mm -hmm. the, the longer film tries to tackle a lot of things. But we make shorter films that are purely just sort of the best of the best footage of these camera traps. A little bit of drama with the characters with Joe, like, trying to get a camera trap set up, and then we have amazing footage of this bear taking it out. No conservation messaging at all, but it's placed on a website then where there's, there's just like packed with conservation messaging. So maybe letting the film just get people's attention and then make them read it, or mm -hmm. I think that we can, you can connect stories so much now that you can try to have them do exactly what they should be doing and not try to do everything within one photo or one story or one film. Yeah. It's, it's a dangerous thing we do with our messaging, you know, because it's very powerful and people actually do read it and they do pay attention. So we recently worked on a story on the coast of British Columbia with a rain wolf and, and scientists think that they might be a, a distinct ecotype, maybe even a distinct subspecies of wolf. And we were so careful not to disclose the locations where these wolves are because they have no protection. So any, anybody is actually encouraged to shoot them, you know, they tell people, if you see wolves, shoot them. And uh, we didn't want to make them vulnerable that way. What ended up happening is they became such a huge tourist attraction that there's so many campers coming to these beaches now to, uh, to see the wolves. And the wolves are so smart, so they're starting to go into people's food. And so now the parks officers are calling for you know, the slaughter of the wolves. They want to kill them because there's human conflict there. And so what we've done is we've turned the spot spotlight back on the wolves to say, OK, here's the island where they are. And we are going to sign a petition to have the entire planet look at these wolves because if they shoot them, we want people to know. And, and that will put a little bit of pause in the conservation officers before they put the trigger, before they decide to kill these animals, that the entire world is watching. But I, I, I made a mistake in one of my captions. What we're calling for is a no-kill policy. We don't want the wolves to be killed. I said, you know, I think the solution should be to close the beaches to campers. There shouldn't be people sleeping on those beaches because there's pops right now. Oh my God, the, the conflict. <laughs> you have no right to tell me where I camp and I live here and you cannot tell me not to go. I mean, oh my God, it was like a shitstorm. Just one mistake, you know. And I didn't pay attention. I was writing the caption in the morning without thinking about the political implications, but they're there for sure. So we have to be careful. And at the same time, not so careful that we don't cause controversy. I think controversial stuff is important. Yeah, we, we want people talking about these things. That's a great question. You know, Jenny and I came up with a great exercise when we were at ILCP to teach photographers the art of storytelling. We used to call it 12 shots. Because in any magazine article, if you're lucky, you'll get 12. I mean, sometimes if you're really good, you get 18 pictures, you know, but most of, all get, most of us get six, seven photographs, and every picture has to do a lot of work to carry the story. So we used to have this thing where photographers, we would do it in a loud bar, in a noisy bar with music playing, and photographers would submit their 12 shots, no text, and the 12 pictures had to tell the story, you know, so it was a great challenge for photographers to find that discipline. In an ideal world, 
you know, you can write as much as you want, but a, a caption should be two paragraphs and no longer. I find that if, if it says, you know, wolf on a rock, it's really boring. So you need to find a little more context, you know? And, and it, yeah, I love writing poetic stuff. Uh, they can get cheesy sometimes. <laughs> be careful. What I do is I study the captions of other photographers, and if, if I like the information, I try to model my captions that way. And I find that people are a lot less interested in the f-stop and in the ISO than they are in, you know, what it felt like to be in the company of this animal. I think it also it totally depends on the platform, right? So Instagram, if you have someone who's written these huge essays, it's annoying to. I guess they've changed. It a is annoying. Yeah. But yeah, I think that there are there are places for more text. And it's one, also one or two paragraphs. Yeah. Who your, who your audience is, right? Like where. Yeah. Where you're using this. Yeah, I, I love captions. You know, I, I, I think we are storytellers. Our caption is an opportunity to tell a story. But I, the designer for my books, he's so anal. You know, he wants all the captions to have the exact same information. <laughs> and so it has to say, you know, Yellowstone National Park, El Her I mean, that's it. Because if we cannot say the same, so I fight with him about it. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a storyteller. I want to tell stories. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. You know, I, I often think about that as photographers, we are the architects of, of the image of what's shown. And what's shown is really important, right? I mean, what, what you choose to leave inside or outside of the frame really matters. And so maybe we need to develop a different set of ideas for what the images should be when you have a niche audience. You're right. It's a different, different structure for sure. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Depending on what you want people to do, if you want them to click or to the side of tissue, or if you want them just to rethink it's true. how Yellowstone, I mean, like, the moral of this was redefining Yellowstone. Like, there wasn't a huge call to action story. But there are some stories that are huge call to actions. And you just, and knowing, like, knowing your audience, like you're saying, and knowing their values, and just thinking about what's going to make them do what you want them to do. Yeah, for example, for the wolves of Vargas that are going to get killed. Um, I have found, I mean, and when we, we hired a psychologist uh, years ago to participate in one of our conferences, a visual psychologist, and he said, you know, it's been proven that when you see on television a uh, picture of the child with the boogers and the flies, you know, people just click away. They don't want to really spend time looking at that. So finding that balance, we were talking about the beautiful pictures and the bad pictures is really important, but for the Vargas wolves, we decided to go with the pups, with the cute, adorable pups, you know, we don't want them to be killed. It's interesting to think, you know, what the reaction would be if you go with a picture of a wolf that's dead, and, well, yeah, these are all very interesting questions, and, um, you know, what is it called, a professional consultancy, or, yeah, I mean, it'd be great to ask a psychologist, right, to help us think through these things, or have some focus groups and see what people think. Yes, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Mapia. Yeah, I love Mapia because it, you know, first of all, it's so diverse, and so I love seeing you know how many photographers approach storytelling from different places, and I learn a lot from Mapia. Uh, and I find that the writing is sometimes really so well, no, sometimes it's really boring, but sometimes it's beautiful. So I was talking to Dorothy Sanders, the, the CEO of Mapia, and I said, you know, what about inviting poets to to post their poetry and then we can complement with our photographs. Or what about if we do the really super short form and it's just one photograph, one caption, and that's the story. And just let's find a discipline to tell stories in different formats. And so I, I love Mafia, so let's keep contributing to that. It's a tragedy that we have such short attention spans, I think. Just Realizing what's happening with Instagram, where we have gone from 15 second videos to one minute videos. <laughs> How much more can you say with that? But um, I, I do a lot of repurposing of my work, you know, where I have one photograph and I write a beautiful caption for it, and then it's part of a larger thing and it's part of a video. I think that's where we can find the variety, but it's so difficult to get eyeballs on your work. It's so hard. No, you know, and I hadn't given it that much thought. I mean, we were talking about the, the monetization of 
things like Instagram, you know, how much is a hashtag worth? If you have a certain number of followers, you know, people want to put out their hashtag on your account, you know, how much is it worth? And so I'm working with Andy Mann, another filmmaker, and he's developed a table, you know, where he, certain number of views or clicks, you know, mean more money. When we were working in Hawaii, the photographers that are surfer photographers, they have a deal with Surfer Magazine for every thousand likes, they get, you know, a hundred dollars more, something like that. I mean, that, now there's incentive right? <laughs> to grow your Instagram account and, and whatnot, but uh, there definitely is a battle, and, and where we're going to find the answer to your question is following the money, I think. I, I, I think. <laughs> I mean, some photographers are already making a lot of money out of their Instagram accounts. I was, I was telling Kali the story that I, I get a lot of, because I have a lot of followers, I get a lot of companies that have no relation to photography or conservation, and they phone me and they say, oh, you know, if we give you da-da-da, we can put a hashtag in your... And it's everything from sandals to lighters to coconut water. You know? So I got a phone call two weeks ago and they said, you know, we're at a, a salon, a wax salon in Santa Monica. And uh, we would like you to put your ha hashtag on your account. But, you know, this is good for you because Kim Kardashian is our customer and so is Jennifer Adams. <laughs> and I said, you know, great, I will. You know, my going rate is, you know, I said $5,000 to see what they said. And they came back and they said, well, we don't have any money, but we can give you a free Brazilian wax. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But you know how I know that we're on the right track? Recently, participating in a lot of festivals and you know, venues where more sports, like the adventure photographers, you know, they've made a lot of money out of their craft, the climbers, the mountain bikers, you know, they're super popular. They're all coming to me now to say, you know, how do I give purpose to my work? How do I become a conservation photographer? I want to be part of ILCP or Sea Legacy. And I say, huh. Maybe we're on the right track. <laughs> Maybe we're doing something that is going to become more important and powerful. I think we are. We have to make a living, you know. I, uh, there was a time when I was not doing photography professionally and I had to support myself with other things. The, the most important thing that we learn as photographers is to be good business people because it's the only way that we can continue to do the work that we do. I like to have a portfolio of activities that sustain my career. And where I make the most of my money is in, you know, I fundraise for my own projects. I heard uh, Ariana Huffington not so long ago said, you know, journalism is going to die if it keeps being supported by advertisement. We have to support it from philanthropy. And so I try to structure my entire body of work so that I can raise money from people who care to support what I do. That's, uh, that's how I support myself. So it's not commercial, it's philanthropic. Um, you know, but if somebody wants to buy my picture and give me $10,000, why not? I'll, I'll say this, you know, Paul, my partner, recently did a, a, he was hired as the talent for a commercial for American Express. Oh my God, he got so much slack from people. You're a sellout, you're, you know, <laughs> in bed with the devil. And he was saying, you know, I'm just trying to make a living. <laughs> but, yeah, that's a valid question. I think those are the most successful ones. Uh, I find, and I'm sure you share the same, those of you who are photographers, how difficult it is to shift from video to still, and back and forth. Uh, I mean, I like working with Jenny because she does the video, and I focus on the skills. And, and collaboration is a wonderful thing, you know, but I agree. The stories that are most successful have an element of, and you see it in the Yellowstone story, you know, having an artist and a writer, and a, it just gives it, makes it robust. And, yeah, and drones are becoming such a huge thing. And are you guys struggling with permits here for flying drones yet? Not yet? No, not quite. <laughs> Nobody talks about it. I mean, it's it's coming. In the United States, it's already you need a pilot license to to drive a drone. In in Canada, only if they catch you. But but you know, drones are such an amazing tool for that perspective. Not really, Rod. I, I I'm I'm a collector. You know, I go out and collect assets, and um, I'm usually thinking about. I don't like making point pictures, um, but I usually have a list. And, and when I work with Paul on assignment, you know, we usually have a hundred photographs that we want to make. And I go routinely back and I check and I check and I check because you forget things. But um, 
I think working for long format gives you all the content you need for other stuff. Uh, maybe that's, that's a discipline to find. Do you guys work on self-assigned projects? You know, I love assignment, assignment. Like this thing that we're going to do here in Tamil Nadu is self-assignment. You're absolutely right. It, it so matters what the audience is. So uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk more about C Legacy and what we're doing with that. But I want to focus, and I don't know if it's going to work. I want to focus on the big NGOs, you know, World Wildlife Fund, Nature Conservancy. They're so big. But I think where the action is really is with the grassroots organizations. I mean, they're the boots on the ground holding the fort. They're the soldiers in the trenches. And when you go to their websites, they never have any pictures. You know? <laughs> Terrible. And so they're the ones that we really want to empower, but the images that we provide for them or the videos we provide for them are going to be very different than the ones that we put up for National Geographic. And I, I think that the art of finding the audience is so important, and making the images for those audiences. And, you know, I think we have so much to think about in, in how do we communicate these things, and I'm glad we're being thoughtful about it. I, I'll tell you what. We have made enormous progress from just 15 years ago when I started thinking about this, when conservation pho photographs, you know, it's just give a camera to a scientist and, you know, let, let him take some pictures with his point and shoot, and that's what they would publish. And you look at these pictures and you think, you know, how can anybody care about this? It's out of focus. <laughs> it, looks, it looks terrible. And, and they were happy with that. That was enough. It just stays in the environment. Yeah, exactly. And, you yeah, know, you cannot bring any new audiences to your issue with bad pictures. So we've made a lot of progress in just showcasing how important beautiful photographs are. And hopefully we're creating a little bit of a market for those images. I mean, not market from a monetary standpoint, but just a consumption standpoint. When you look at the Instagram accounts that people follow, they follow beautiful photographs, even if they have impactful content. 